be seated. Today's scripture lesson comes from the Hebrew text, 1 Samuel. And I just want to share with you, just, if you just want some really good reading and good storytelling, 1 and 2 Samuel, you, you just can't beat it. I promise you it has everything in the world in it. It has triumph, and despair, and murder, and cover-up, and all those things we love to wear, or to read and watch. But this is the beginning of the story of the great prophet Samuel, so hear these words. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife, Peniah, and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a noble portion because he loved her, and the Lord closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, and bless his heart, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up now. Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair at the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. When she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, I will, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor shall ever be used on his head. As she wept on, and as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. No, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may God of Israel grant you what you have been asking of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked, because I asked the Lord for him. So this is the beginning of the story of one of Israel's great prophets, Samuel. Samuel would be the one to anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. Samuel would be the one to anoint David when he was still a young teenage boy, seeing the potential in him, and anoint him not only as king but priest of Israel. So Samuel played an incredibly important role. Now, his beginning is very consistent with hero stories that were told during that time. It's very consistent. Even in our own stories of Jesus, we have two different books, Mark and Luke, who give us, the, I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke, who give us the typical miracle birth narrative. And so we have that here as well. Now, one thing that I want to do today is use this story as a metaphor as to how to create the miraculous in our own life. One thing that I am not going to do and have no intention of doing is using this story to convey to those people who are having trouble having children or who cannot have children, to, to convey somehow that you're not faithful enough and God is not listening to you. That, I think, is cruel, and preachers who do that, then shame on them. So we're going to use this story strictly as a metaphor. One of the things that I've been studying and doing over the years is dream work, uh, working with, reading the, the writings of Carl Jung. 
And I believe that in our dreams, it's our unconscious self trying to communicate something to our conscious mind. And in our dreams, we have typically three characters. We have ourself, the, the, the gender opposite, and then, a, and then the same gender. For in my case, I would, my dreams, the opposite of me would be the anima, a female, so she would typically take the primary role in my dreams, and then if I dream of another man, he represents either my shadow self and or spiritual guide. So, in dream work, whether you are pregnant in your dream or someone in you was pregnant in a dream, it's an archetype that we're about to give birth to something new in our lives. Something that we're going to create, something that we're going to accomplish. So using this story as metaphor, Hannah gets pregnant as we get pregnant in our dreams and we're about to start something new and wonderful. Now, oftentimes by the time we become conscious of a vision that we have, something that we're wanting to create and manifest, from that moment we become conscious of it and we become committed to following through on it, then there is that long in-between time to we're able to manifest it. All right? My whole life, I was the kid in the back seat 45 minutes into an eight-hour trip saying, are we there yet? People say, enjoy the journey. I have never enjoyed the journey. Once I see it, I want it now. I want it, and then I'm frustrated because I can't create, and I'm not even sure sometimes what I'm trying to create, but I just want it to happen now. So for me, the in-between time of vision and manifestation can be a very frustrating time. And during those frustrating times, then we can sometimes make desperate decisions because we're trying to force something before it is ready. And what I have learned over and over and over again, that desperate decisions create desperate results. And when I try to move something before it is ready, too hard and fast, then I end up spending a lot of en energy trying to correct what I've just destroyed, all right? So, Hannah found herself in complete despair. We see that in the story that it was a time in Hebrew history of polygamy. So, Elkanah had a, one wife who had no problem having children, and Hannah, he loved her. And it makes no bones about it. He really loved this woman, but she could not. And she found herself in complete despair. She knew very clearly what she wanted in this life, in her life, and what she wanted to create, but she wasn't there yet. And what I learned from this story, using it as metaphor, is that sometimes what seems has been closed to us is just not opened yet. I'll use the sculpture as an example. The first ideas of it came 20 years before I completed it. It transferred from one kind of drawing to another kind of drawing to a painting to sculptures that kept breaking, the armatures kept breaking, to a place where when I was finally going to finish it, completely changed the theme and started all over again to completing the sculpture, which was 20 years. And I can tell you, especially that last year and a half, I had some despair about it. But that's the way it works. I don't know why it is, but it seems like what we really want most in life is you have to work very hard and be committed to make it come true. Think about the people who inspire you and you read their biography or their autobiography. We always see the end result, but often they tell you the story of all the challenges and the obstacles that were in the way while they were coming from concept to manifestation. So it's normal to feel like despair when we're trying to give birth to something that we so clearly can see, but it's not here yet. Hannah was tormented by one of her family members. Sometimes we have families who don't understand us, right? See, someone's already laughing out loud. We just seem to be different than everyone around us. I've heard it said that our friends are God's apology for the family we were born into, all right? And it says that, that Elkanah's other wife would just torment her constantly. 
on the way to, ch- to synagogue, on the way to temple to make a sight. She to- to- tormented her to a place where she would be in tears over and over and over again. Now, this is not a unique story in the Hebrew traditions. You have the story of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. Jacob is one of the founding fathers of the, of the Hebrew faith. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob saw Rachel bringing her father's sheep to, to the watering well and fell in love with her immediately. He went to her father Laban and asked to marry Rachel, but his father-in-law was more um, conniving than even Jacob was. Jacob had met his match. Work for me for seven years and then I'll give you my daughter. He worked hard, everything he touched, Midas touched, everything he multiplied, it grew, it grew. It came time for the wedding day and they had the huge wedding feast. And when he went into the wedding chamber to make love to his wife, Rachel, they lifted the veil and found it was her, uh, her sister, Leah. Leah was not as pretty as Rachel. He did not like Leah. He had been duped. He challenged his father-in-law, and his father-in-law says, what, I can, do I let you marry a younger daughter before the older? You know how it goes. You have to marry the oldest off first and then go down. So he makes another deal, works another seven years, and then he gets to marry Rachel. So as Rachel and Leah are going along with their life with Jacob, Leah seems to have no problem having babies where Rachel cannot. So it's, it's a common theme that when someone's going to give birth to something magnificent, there are obstacles in the way. And there might be people who are jeering at us and criticizing us all along. One of the things it says in the story is that the Lord closed her womb. Now, this is why it's important to, to read these stories with someone who knows what they're about. Out of context, it might sound like that God somehow was punishing Hannah. And then if a minister were to preach about it in English, not doing the background work, it looks as though God punishes some people and God doesn't others. Why does God allow the woman who provokes Hannah all the time have all the babies and Hannah who wants one so badly? She can't. Early Hebrew theology, God did everything. God did everything. If it was a bumper crop, God did it. If it was a famine, God did it. If they lost a battle, God did it. If they won a battle, the right hand of God made them win. If a woman got pregnant, God did it. If a woman couldn't, God did it. So that was a common thing. I want you to know that as you go through your life, manifesting your visions and manifesting your dreams and giving birth to that which you have great passion about, God is not against you. Those of us who have children, how many of us would be able to forget our children? Think about it. Can you just forget them altogether? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I, Foster lives with me. Oh, yeah. I completely forgot. I inherited a 16-year-old who was one of the most wonderful things in all of my life. And even though Foster is not my biological child, I think about her all the time. I worry about her. I hope for her. I dream for her. I cheer her on, you see. If we cannot forget our children, then why would God forget us? So just have a knowing about that. Now, the idea somehow that God has abandoned us is also a very common theme in the Bible that we use as our, our, as our, our spiritual guide. And the Psalms, my, my, my Old Testament scholar said that in the Psalms, especially the Psalms of Lament, it is the absence of the present God. And even Jesus himself, when he was on the cross, proclaimed out at one moment of great agony, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So when we're in that in-between place and we're working so hard to manifest, and it's easy, when I, it, it's, it's, it's normal to think at times when things are very hard, that God somehow has abandoned us and leave us, left us alone. So oftentimes what we think has closed is just not yet. Just keep that in the back of your mind as you're working so hard to create the miraculous in your life. Some of us, because of obstacles, might say to ourselves or to those around us, well, I tried this, I put my whole self into it, it's not working out, so it must be God's will for me not to do it. That's an easy trap to fall into. 
That's a way we can rationalize and justify giving up. See? Well, it's obviously not working out. God must not want me to do it. Let me, I want to share with you how I understand God's will. I believe God's will is that you fulfill your complete self, however it is that you're going to do that. I don't believe that God is so involved in our everyday activity that, oh, I do this, that's God's will. Oh, I did this, that's not God's will. I cannot tell you how much time and energy I have wasted in my life trying to figure out what God's will was. And while I'm trying to figure it out, I'm not manifesting anything. I assume right now I'm in God's will because I'm here. When I go to my studio and create art, I assume it's God's will. When I'm talking to you, I assume it's God. I just assume I am in God's will because I'm consciously involved with the Spirit of God in my life. And once we just assume we're in the will, then that takes all the pressure off. I'm trying to figure out what God wants us to do and what God doesn't. Just follow your passion. I often just assume that the vision, the image that I have in my mind is planted there by my own spirit and God's spirit working together. But it's my job to do whatever it takes to make it a reality. One of the things that <clears throat> has been so beneficial to me during my tenure here is that we have many very successful people. People who've achieved incredible things, wonderful things. There was one gentleman who was a member of our church. He's deceased now, but he was a wonderful mentor for me. I played golf with him almost every Friday for 10 years, John Dietrich. And so I asked John one day, John, what is the secret to your success? And this is what he told me. Once you're clear about what it is you're going to do, do it and never give up. Don't let anything get in your way. Stick with it and make it come true. I have found that to indeed be the case. When I came to Windermere back in 1995, I found that within about a year or two that I could see that we were no longer going to be able to stay in the little historic building in the town of Windermere. I could see it. I didn't know how we were going to leave it, but I could see it. Then one day, Bill Sims, the late Bill Sims, another mentor that I had, said, I think that we're going to have to build another building and, and, and expand. And then one day at a board meeting, Bob Minnick, who was still very much alive, said, I think that we need to look at it and building a new building and expanding. And there it went. I said, ah, okay, here we go. But what did that do to me? That was a crossroads for me. I thought, okay, I can just settle and be the pastor of this lovely little parish and this historic building in the lovely town of Windermere and just cruise. And no one would think ill about me for doing it. Or I can take on this new challenge and meet the obstacles and all the challenges and leading a congregation to relocate and build a different facility, knowing what the backlash was going to be. I find it interesting that over half my tenure now, we have been in this building. For some of you, this is the only Windermere church you know. Many people did not make the transition with us. They were very connected to the property, to the building, because of what it meant to them sentimentally. We built this church during the worst time of building. Everything was inflated, 2006, and then two years later, in 2008, the economy crashed. When you have a choice of paying your mortgage or making a donation to the church, which one are you going to do? And that's not a judgment, that's a reality. We struggled. It's not even been to like the last maybe two or three years that we've stopped struggling financially as a congregation. But God provided. And there were times that I thought, my God, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done to these people who've never had a mortgage? But then a United Methodist Church came along looking for a place to do a new church start. And they paid us $52,000 a year for three years to, to rent our space. That's what we needed to break even or come close. After that, we were able to do it on ourselves. The church did not make it, but then we got another incredible blessing from that church. And that's Martha and Del Harriman. And they've been incredible assets to it. But you, you see, it took a long time. 
My vision started in 1997. The church was created in 2006, and here we are, maybe 2015. We're finally getting a good place financially to support what we do here. See? It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to listen to the negative voices. But stick with it. When she went to the temple to pray, Hannah, she was praying with all passion, giving it all that she had to give. And the priest, who was not able to, to be at all sensitive to her, <laughs> accused her of being drunk. Please know that as you are sharing your vision, as you are sharing your dreams, there are going to be people to try to dissuade you from them. It might be family members, it might be, it might be friends, it might be your religion. You're not going to get it from me. But it could happen with somebody else. It could be culture. Who do you think you are, right? What right have you to try to stand up and make something of yourself and present this to the world? We had a, a, a youth minister here named Steve Case. Most of you remember Steve, right? And one of the things he used to say to our young people, and while they were talking about manifesting their dreams, as he would say, it's a little crude, profound, and amazing at the same time. He said, kids, believe me, there is always someone who's going to pee in your Fruit Loops. <laughs> it's true. There's always someone. But for some reason, it seems to be the gig that we have. I believe God, the universe, the heavenly hosts, and even our own soul want to know how committed are you to making this a reality. Then the story tells us that she went home from that place. Something happened to her there. She was transformed. It says that she was no longer downcast. She went home and she ate. This is an important clue in manifesting your own miracles in your life. She went home with a knowing in her. There was no more doubt. She had a knowing deep inside of her. I know that I have done all I can do to make this a reality. And that's just called trusting. And she ate. A key thing to do as we are manifesting the miracles or the visions in our lives is to nurture ourselves. Feed yourselves. Feed yourself not on the negative feedback, but on those who are supporting and cheering you on. Read. Read about everybody and everything that someone has tried similar to your own and be inspired by them. And also nurturing is taking a break and stepping back to see the bigger picture. I can tell you as an artist, I have been this close to the canvas or to the sculpture and I painted or sculpted a perfect eye only to step back and realize that the other eye is up here and the one I just did is down here. Okay? It's important that as we're manifesting the vision and the miracles in our life that we step back, we take some time out and we see the bigger picture or we can become incredibly hyper-focused and distracted and create something that we didn't want to do or have to go back and redo. And the passage says, and the Lord remembered her. When from the beginning, the Lord closed her womb to the Lord remembered her. God has never forgotten you. And when she went home, she ate, she nurtured herself, she had a knowing, and she made love to her husband, and she gave birth to a son named Samuel. Because I asked the Lord. Her miracle was created out of love. So whatever it is, our vision that we have, whatever it is that we're wanting to create and manifest in this world, let it be a labor of love. Because if it's anything else, its impact upon the world around you will be lesser than. If we create out of love and out of passion, then you not only will bless you and celebrate within yourself that you accomplish this, but your accomplishment will help others. And that's the last thing that I want us to see in this. As she was pleading with God, she promised God that if he would grant her this son, that she would give back the son to the world. And she did when he was weaned. And Samuel spent his days in the temple 
and eat with Eli until the day he went on his own. So it's important when we have a vision and we're trying to create and manifest something that we have a passion about, that we don't try to hoard it to ourselves. I believe God gives us the vision and our spirit with God's spirit inspires us so that what we manifest is something we give back to the world. Because that's how we participate in the kingdom of God and the realm of God. That as we share our, our passion, as we create, as we manifest our visions, we not only inspire our own selves and feel a sense of accomplishment, but we also inspire the world around us and help others. This is an incredible story of how a person went from the stage of vision and idea, worked through the process of the frustrations, walked away with the confidence that it's going to happen, I don't know when, to giving it back. And that, my friends, is what I believe we do to create and make our visions and our dreams and our miracles a reality. Let us pray. God, for some reason, you did not make it easy. But if it were easy, how passionate would we be? It seems that the part of this gig in life is that what we truly want to create and achieve, we have to work really hard for it and really, really want it. Forgive us when we create excuses as to why we should stop trying. Forgive us when we think that you've abandoned us, but I know you know in our hearts that we know that you have not. But help us to also see that what we need to create and the vision you place within us is not just for us, but it's part of your greater scheme, your greater purpose in this world. May we just walk away from here today just knowing that and be confident that you are using us now and that we are in your will now. Thank you for all the mentors. Thank you for all the heroic men and women. Thank you for all the people who have overcome all the obstacles to show us how that if we stick to it, what we can create is a beautiful, beautiful thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.